So topic 5.2 is terrestrial food production systems and food choices. Our first significant idea being that sustainability of terrestrial food, sy uh, food systems, just like all sustainability, really depends on the environment being uh, solid, having a, a solid community, uh, and then an economy to support all of that as well. Um, and then our other significant idea is that consumers have a role to play through their support of different terrestrial food production systems. Um, obviously, you know, they say like you vote with your dollars uh, when you buy different products um, and some people make choices uh, when they buy those products. Um, you might have more or less ability to make those choices based on other factors um, like the economic stability of your situation, for example. Um, and then the supply of food is inequitably available and land suitable for food production is also unevenly distributed among societies. Uh, so a lot of times places that have a lot of people might also not have very good soil uh, for growing crops. Um, you could see lots of our areas that do have lots of um, inhabitation uh, may not have very good soils in general. Uh, whereas areas that haven't had degraded soil yet, uh, usually not many people living up there. Um, but kind of interesting, a lot of times they'll ask you about impacts from climate change, which often can include positive and negative impacts. One positive impact of climate change is as it warms up, we have a lot more uh, area for farming uh, as these places um, that used to be super cold through most of the year get a lot warmer. Um, so the sustainability of terrestrial food production system is influenced by a lot of different factors. Are we doing large scale or small scale? Um, are we using fossil fuels? while we uh, produce our food. Uh, it's actually kind of crazy how much food prices are linked to gas prices. Uh, and as gas prices go up, food prices go up because we you know, grow our food on one part of the country and then ship it elsewhere where we grow soy somewhere and then bring it to a feed lot and then feed it to animals there and then bring them to a slaughterhouse and then process the meat there and then send it to a McDonald's somewhere. And there's a lot of transportation in our food systems. Uh, water use is also super intensive and that really depends on the, the type of crop uh, or the type of animal. You know, it's like many, many more times water for, for cattle versus chickens, for example, a lot more water for crops like cotton um, than other crops. Um, and then of course you could do, you know, um, pesticides, fertilizers, etc. cetera. Um, inequalities exist in food production and distribution around the world. Um, so you can sort of compare, right? We got really industrialized, heavy mechanized system, uh, and then a really labor intensive system, uh, here, uh, where human labor versus machine labor, you might, you might sort of question like, well, I guess they're both harvesting at this point. Right. But it looks like she's in the early stages of harvesting. They've fully harvested. If you had a picture of this before it was harvested, you might have a different opinion on it, but there's definitely lots of erosion happening there too. Can't deny that. Uh, food waste is prevalent in both less economically developed and more economically developed countries, uh, but for different reasons. A lot of times uh, people say that there's plenty of food, it's just about the distribution of food. Uh, that's sort of the issue. Um, and then a lot of different factors sort of play into uh, choices of food production systems. Uh, obviously, our economic factors are huge, um, but they might also be cultural, right? Like here in the US, we eat lots of corn and soy. Uh, it's like read a label of any processed food you have. I bet you'll find one of those too. Um, whereas other places might have other staple foods uh, or maybe based on the region that you're in, you know, you can grow certain crops in certain areas and I'm not growing tropical fruits up here. Um, and then other, other factors as well. Um, so a lot of these sort of overlap too um, with different ideas. You know, if you're more of a technocentric, you might uh, have a different solution to an ecocentric trying to make like a ecological forest or something or a, a, a fruit forest like we're trying to do here on our campus. Um, as the human population grows uh, with urbanization and degradation of soil, we also have the ability for food uh, or land for food decreasing. Um, so that really requires that we are sort of doing more intensive agriculture, right? We're getting more food out of smaller areas of land. Um, and we've actually um, gotten way better at that over time. Um, so this uh, particular image is, is showing the amount of arable land going down. But what it's not really including is before 1970, 
um, when we didn't really have a lot of techniques to increase our output of, of agriculture through things like fertilizer, through things like pesticides, which has really helped to, to feed tons of people on the earth, um, around the earth. Um, okay, so the yield of food per unit area from lower trophic levels is greater in quantity, lower in cost, and may require fewer resources. Um, so you could sort of just do a thought experiment, right? If you want to, you know, have a, a garden and raise vegetables versus trying to raise an animal and then feed that animal all the vegetables from your garden versus eating all those vegetables yourselves. Um, as we saw on the previous page, there's lots of other reasons you might be eating animals um, besides just trying to use the least amount of energy. You might have cultural reasons. Um, you might just like to eat animals. Um, but as far as uh, uh, ecolo ecology goes um, and the second law of thermodynamics, right? We're losing energy at each trophic level, um, which is actually why we do most of our farming with, with herbivores and not with carnivores. Because if you're raising carnivores and you got to freaking feed them all these herbivores, that's a lot of work too, right? Um, let's see. And then cultural choices uh, can lead us to harvesting food from higher trophic levels. Um, and as we saw with the water unit too, I mean, you get some, some sort of cultural reasons that people might hunt animals that other people might think is crazy to hunt, right? Like, like whaling, uh, which becoming less common these days, but also certain cultures, they still eat dogs, right? And other people are like, that's insane. How could you ever eat a dog? Um, different places. Um, so here's some information on different levels of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so we're including uh, carbon dioxide as well as non-CO2 gases. Um, so right, you're, you're burning CO2 or you're producing CO2 as you burn all the fossil fuels to grow all your crops, to run your tractors. Um, but things like cows are also producing methane. Um, people say, oh, cow farts, but actually it's more cow burps. Um, as they're digesting food in their four stomachs, it makes a lot of methane and then they release that methane. Um, so as, as we've mentioned, methane is super, uh, potent, really strong greenhouse gas. So that's why it's really high in the, in the, uh, carbon equivalent rating. Um, so we can compare and contrast different food systems based on their inputs and outputs. Um, so you could see sort of like a, a really intensive agriculture versus more, um, a natural type of system. Uh, maybe emphasizing one crop in monocultures versus having like a um, like a diverse area, trying to recreate a natural ecosystem, right? Uh, polycultures, um, trying to have little external outputs, maybe trying to have more of a cyclical system versus lots of fertilizers that come from somewhere else and pesticides that are coming from somewhere else and being produced elsewhere and using energy when they're being produced. Um, looking at multiple outputs versus just trying to maximize your yields, having lots of labor, right? We have work jobs every day in the farm. Well, not every day, um, but uh, every week, twice a week um, versus having lots of machines as we've seen. Um, cool, cool. Uh, genetically modified organisms, way more common in the large scale farms. Though you might have like a large scale farm that's like non-GMO, but still is like a you know massive organic farming corporation. Um, could exist still, right? It's all a spectrum. Um, so we could increase sustainability um, by altering human activity to reduce meat consumption and increase consumption of organically grown and locally produced terrestrial food products. Um, so it does take a lot of resources to produce meat, but that's not just to say that um, you can just stop eating meat and then solve problems that way because there's a lot of unsustainable practices in other types of agriculture. Right, and you can raise meat really sustainably. We have, um, you know, herbivores in the desert that sort of take the place of all the natural herbivores here, um, and can help to cycle nutrients by um, defecating where they're feeding, and they can help to um, encourage succession by uh, keeping the grasses shorter. Uh, there's ways to have more and less sustainable meat consumption, as there's way to do everything more and less sustainably. Um, so we can uh, make increase sustainably by um, increasing our labels. Um, uh, so uh, we see ingredient labels, uh, which you actually can thank Ralph Nader for all of that. Uh, he did a lot of work back in the, I believe, 70s, maybe 80s on getting nutrition labels on everything. 
Um, before that, you might have no idea what was actually in your food. Um, and there weren't any laws because, yeah, most people that give to politicians are the people that are selling the food and they just want you to buy it. Um, so other ways we could do this are by monitoring uh, and controlling standards. Um, so in the US, we have like the, um, oh geez, the uh, Food and Agriculture Administration um, or the FDA as well. Um, and so they can maintain all these things. Um, here we have some buffer zones. Uh, so really great tie-in with topic four, right? Uh, so if you have some runoff of pesticides or fertilizers, ideally they're absorbed um, by those trees. Uh, so you should be able to analyze some tables and graphs, talk about differences in inputs and outputs of uh, food production systems. Uh, so here's a few different places, Oceania, Africa, Europe. Uh, you should be able to uh, compare and contrast the system characteristics as well. So intensive, small area, high output versus extensive, larger areas, less, um, less intensive resource use. Subsistence farming for our own um, subsistence, right? Trying to survive off of that versus commercial for-profit farming. Uh, and then you should be able to evaluate some environmental impacts too. How do they differ in different farming techniques? Uh, and then discuss how social cultural systems uh, can influence food production systems as well, all related. And then finally, evaluate different strategies to increase sustainability. Remember, evaluate, it's got your positives, it's got your negatives, and it has the overall conclusion, which directly re refers to the positives and the negatives that you mentioned. Uh, shout out to Mr. Kramer for all these excellent sites.